by my two fellow co-chief residents, uh, who I'll introduce in just a second. First, uh, I just wanted to uh, give a public shoot, shout out to Alicia Doxson. I don't know, probably most of us were included on her email. And I was very sad to hear that she's going to be leaving us after many years of dedicated service. Um, Alicia has done an outstanding job with the residents and with medical students. Her job gets harder every year, and she's been able to manage it flawlessly. And always with a smile on her face, and we really appreciated her service. So if we can all give her a round of applause. Um, so our, our grand round today is going to be presented by first uh, Dr. Brian Stagg, uh, who's going to talk about 86, an 86-year-old lady with lacrimal gland swelling. Um, Dr. Stagg will be followed by Dr. Russell Swan, uh, who will talk about Susak syndrome. So we'll let you guys get started. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Adam. I feel like, uh, so Russell and I are in our last year of residency, I feel like things have gotten a lot more intense for Grand Rounds. Now we've got this big light in front of us and I'm hooked up to microphones and uh, so things, things have changed over the last few years in terms of Grand Rounds. Um, I'm really glad to be here. I also wanted to take just a, a quick second. Um, I, I normally wouldn't talk about something really personal at, at Grand Rounds, but I thought um, I just really need to thank people, so I thought I'd take a quick second. Um, most of you know my, my wife uh, was pregnant and went into preterm labor last week, and the, our, our baby survived only a few minutes. And uh, it was pretty tough, but uh, I just wanted to thank everyone here for so much support from my co-residents and from my attendings, um, from the academic team, and just from the Moran in general. We received some, some beautiful flowers, and it really, makes a big difference when you have something hard happen just to have such a great support system. And I really feel fortunate to be here at the Moran Eye Center to, where, where we re it really does feel like a family and we really have the support of, um, like I said, really amazing co-residents too. So thank you all for that. Um, and also just kind of introducing our, our topics for, for me and Russell. So as, as residents, we're required to do three neuro-ophthalmology grand rounds and uh, it, Pretty frequently happens that we get get to our last year of residency and there's still at least one left. And so uh, today, Russell and I are both doing a, a neuro ophthalmology presentation. It's one that I prepared with Dr. Patel's help for the oculoplastics grand rounds. And so, um, and we did we ran out of time that day to give. So I'm also giving that presentation. Um, so my first first presentation is uh, my neuro ophthalmology presentation. So red eye and double vision present, presenting to triage clinic. And I titled it this way. I, I think that one of the most difficult jobs at the Moran Eye Center is the triage clinic, where anything can, anything can walk in the door and, you don't, and you're not sure what, what it's going to be. Most of the time, it's something really simple, and then sometimes it can be something bad. So I, th I think it, I, I really uh, respect all of our doctors that work in, in triage. So 71-year-old man with uh, red right eye and double vision. And symptoms started three to four days earlier. His right eye redness, so just first noticed the right eye redness and swelling, and then a little bit of pain when he'd look to the right. And he'd have binocular vertical and horizontal diplopia that was worse in right gaze. Um, and so I, I thought we could just start, we, we've got OCAPs coming up this week. I thought we could just start with uh, one of our PGY2 residents and just kind of talk through I know it's really early for a differential, but I feel like in triage clinic, it's important to be able to, to put together a quick differential early um, to be efficient. So, I don't know. Reese? Um, yes. Just kind of, what, what are you thinking? How are you going to approach this patient? Nice. Any, so those are kind of some of the more concerning things you might be worried about. Anything you can think of that might be less concerning that probably comes up a lot in triage too? Just dry eye, but I would expect that that'd be binoculars 
Right, exactly. But I, but I think those like dry eye or conjunctivitis or, or things are always, you see them so often in triage that those probably are running through your head too. So how to, how to kind of sort that out. So in, in triage clinic and on call, history ends up, ends up becoming really important. Um, so past ocular history was hit in the right eye at age 10. He was really concerned about that. He wanted to, to talk about, that was the biggest thing he wanted to talk about. Um, past medical history, he has multiple myeloma. He was diagnosed in 2007, had a bone marrow transplant, and has active disease. He, he restarted chemotherapy in January. He had a compression fracture of his spine, uh, reflux disease, chronic kidney disease, um, and then he's a non-smoker and had a father with CLL. And so on exam, his, his vision was great. His pressure, no issues with pressure, no afferent pupillary defect. Color vision was normal, but he was proptotic on, on that right side. Um, so then exam, he had a little bit of edema on that, on that right side, and then chemosis, and it was described as straw-colored fluid. Um, he had some punctate staining, and then uh, otherwise pretty normal exam. So here's his motility. Um, so a left hyper with a little bit of exophoria was documented as. Um, so at all times when you see a left hyper, does anyone kind of want to talk through what, you, what you're thinking about when you, when you see a hypertropia? Maybe, maybe just to expand the differential a little bit now. Eileen, do you want to do it? Um, so, yeah, kind of talk through the differential. So what, what next steps are you going to do for this patient? Chris Conradi, do you want to kind of talk about what you'd... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I didn't know. <laughs> couldn't see you back there. Yeah. So what, so what imaging do you want to do, Eileen? Yeah. So, so we did... So triage clinic, Dr. Dr. Taven ordered an MRI. And uh, did so a mass. So there are multiple new enhancing right intraorbital masses. Um, there was a, a larger uh, intracor intraconal mass, and then a few other masses. So one near the cavernous sinus, and then one uh, between the temporalis muscle and the lateral pterygoid muscle. So just by the maxillary sinus. And so he was admitted to the hematology oncology service, treated with. Decadron, and they did a PET CT, and the PET CT showed a number of other lesions uh, throughout his body. And so we we saw him back in follow up at in the ophthalmology clinic. Uh, I think Dr. Joe saw him in follow up. He still had the diplopia, but his uh, visual function remained normal. He still didn't have an afferent pupillary defect. Still normal color vision. And so treatment plan. Uh, he was evaluated. So what what we're what this looked like and what the Hemonc service thought it was because it was throughout and just the appearance of it felt like it was a uh, recurrence of his multiple myeloma and effect, uh, multiple myeloma affecting the orbit. And so they uh, recommended that he see radiation oncology and continue his chemotherapy. He actually did see radiation oncology and they, they did recommend some treatment, but he wasn't interested in it at, at that time. But he's still receiving chemotherapy. And so just to, as I mentioned, this kind of short, shorter presentations today because there are three of them. Just a quick review on a, an interesting, the best paper I found about multiple myeloma in, involving the orbit. I had never seen that before. So this, this was uh, their case series. So let me see. Where did I leave it? Laser pointer. So this, this was their case case series, they had 34 patients uh, with orbital myeloma. So 34 of them ended up being multiple myeloma. One ended up being a plasma, or 13 ended up being a plasma cytoma. And 
five ended up being primar primary extramedullary plasma cytoma. So 65% uh, of those patients had been diagnosed beforehand, which is similar to our patient. And so uh, a number of them, so the ones that had prior diagnosis, the average was 17.6 17 months, maximum was eight years. So our patient, patient was diagnosed in 2007, so would be right at the, the edge of that, that limit in their case series. Um, interestingly, and I think something just to keep in mind with, with differential diagnosis is that a number of those, that was their, the orbital findings were their initial presentation for multiple myeloma. Um, and then proptosis was the most common. 23% of them had decreased vision, which fortunately our patient didn't. And then 23% had uh, diplopia, which was the biggest thing that our patient had. And a small percentage of them were bilateral. And so this, this was just interesting, just going through their imaging. 84, so most of them had CT, some of them had MRIs. Um, so this was just interesting. The intraconal was, was less common than the other things. If you remember, our patient had, that, had several extraconal, but then one very large intraconal mass. And this paper only had survival data on 17 patients, and the mean survival was 23 months. Um, so poor prognosis, but, but that's actually close to in line with, with what you'd expect from multiple myeloma if, with recurrences. So, and just thank you, I, I, I think, so I, I saw the patient with uh, Dr. Feist uh, when he was on the consult service. I think it was staffed with Dr. Crum, and then Dr. Jose also saw the, the patient in follow-up. So any discussion about neuro-ophthalmology? Yeah, Dr. Crum. from a cost-effectiveness standpoint. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you, Dr. Crum, for that. Any other thoughts? Okay. Right. So symptomatically, yeah. did he improve? Or was he no, he was, it was just that way. It didn't, didn't really change much. Um, I, I think if maybe radiation oncology would have pushed more if there had been visual compromise. Or, or things like that, but he 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 wasn't really interested in radiation and like probably reasonable. Right. Yeah. No. No. As, uh, sorry, I should have shown the visual fields, but his visual function was completely normal, which was kind of surprising with how what the mass looked like. Um, and and. Correct, correct. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Yeah, don't worry, Dr. Crumb's watching the visual fields. Um, but it, it was, uh, I, I, so he had the MRI and went home, and then I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Reese, but I think you got paged about that on call, and they said, we, we have a patient from triage that had this imaging, and so ended up calling him and, and getting him to come in to be admitted to Hemonc eventually. So it was good working together with the, the Hemonc, Hemonc team as well. So nice job, Reese.